Thanks very much. I just want to point, emphasise that, uh, like Reggie, I'm a member of USU, so I was on strike on, on Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not simply... I don't simply write about the falling rate of profit. Um, uh, and, in fact, um, I, it's seriously true. I was trying to work out how many days I've been on strike over the last two, three years, and I'm not quite sure. And that's a reflection of how Yusu, since it was formed, has been transformed from, um, certainly in my bit of the union, a, a professional association into a militant union. And that, the, the reason why that's happened is, is a symptom of how, in the neoliberal era, the whole of the public sector has been restructured and in increasingly subordinated to the logic of profits and competition, and therefore has transfer, transformed at least some professors into trade union militants. Now, um, but of course now we face uh, a much bigger challenge, because uh, November the 30th, 30th was absolutely fantastic, but we're going to need a lot more like it to beat what's facing us. Because what we're confronted with is a situation in which the leading capitalist classes have embraced the cult of austerity. And of course the immediate target, we see this immediately with Osborne and Cameron and so on, but this is a general process. In the US, um, because of the deal that Obama made with the right-wing lunatic Republicans in Congress back in the summer, and for various other reasons of congressional skullduggery, currently the US is legally committed to cutting public spending over the next few years by $1.4 trillion, billion, billion dollars. Now, even these days, that's a lot of money. And, of course, in the, um, in the Eurozone, we have really utter right-wing lunacy reigning. I mean, the latest proposals that Sarkozy and Merkel have agreed involve, among another, other things, the European Court of Justice supervising national government budgets. Now, I mean, this is mad. I mean, what do, I mean, what do judges... I mean, judges, I suppose, know about the law, but what do they know about economics? Who are they accountable to? This is a reflection or radicalisation of something that we've seen in neoliberalism, which is transferring democratic decision-making away from anyone who's accountable, making it undemocratic, putting it in the hands of so-called experts. So we have the supposedly expert judges who are going to be telling governments how much they can spend and what they can tax. We have the so-called technocratic governments that have been imposed on Greece and on Italy. And let's be clear, they're not technocrats, they're not experts. These are governments of the banks and for the banks. That's essentially what's going out on throughout the Eurozone. A massive attempt to rescue the banks that <coughs> precipitated the crisis at the expense of the ma mass, of, mass of people. But it's important to see that what we're confronted with isn't just an outburst of mass idiocy. I mean, it's t at the top of society, I mean. Um, not among us. I mean, it's, it's very tempting to look at the top and think that we're ruled by complete morons, complete crazed ideologues. And some of the time, uh, that's absolutely true. But the fact that they're pursuing such irrational and destructive policies reflects something much more deep-seated. That what we are caught in the grip in of is a very deep-seated crisis of the whole capitalist system. And it's worth saying something briefly of what, what are the sources of that, that crisis. I am going to talk about the rate of profit, actually, because the, the leading capitalist economies have been in the grip of a crisis of profitability that began in the 1960s, but which they have failed to overcome. All, all that we've suffered, the forcing down of wages, the restructuring of the public sector, the sacking of huge numbers of workers, everything that neoliberalism has, has involved, the spread of the market into every aspect of life, has been intended to restore profitability by squeezing workers more. But it's failed. And so what increasingly, in, in re, in, over the last couple of decades, uh, the managers of the system have done is to let the financial markets rip in the hope that the engine of speculation centred of the, the financial markets, could drive economic growth. And that's what happened, for example, in the US 
and, and here actually in the late 90s and the mid, mid to 2000s. But what that meant was when the bubble burst, when the financial markets collapsed, as inevitably they did in 2007, 2008, that didn't just break the financial system. And it's important to understand the financial system is really bust, that most banks are just bankrupt shells held up, well, held up by our money, actually, <laughs> kept in being by public, public support here and in, in much of the, the rest of the world, but that the engine that had driven economic growth itself was broken. And they tried hard to put the engine back together, but they failed. And the result is a crisis that is not improving, but is getting worse. Not just in Europe, not just in Britain, not just in the United States. If you look at the latest figures from countries like China and Brazil, they are being dragged into the vortex of an economic crisis set, centered on the advanced capitalist countries. So this is a big deal. This isn't just you know, a few right-wing lunatics who've managed to crawl their way into government in Britain or so something like this. This is a really deep-seated crisis of the system, which the bosses don't know how to resolve, but, and the only thing that they can, they can manage to do, you know, the one thing they, they can remember is crush the workers, force down living standards, smash people's lives, destroy their jobs. That's the only way in which they can... Si that's, that's their instinctual solution to, the, to, the, to the, the problems that they face but they can't deal with. And what that means is we really are in a situation where it's necessary to talk about an alternative to the sis system. For many years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became impossible to talk about alternatives to capitalism. You, you, know, you wanted the gulag, you wanted concentration camps if you wanted to get rid of capitalism. That was how the, the debate presented itself. But now things are changing. And it is necessary to talk about alternatives. And it can seem difficult, because if you listen to the radio, or watch television, or read the papers, you have all these idiots singing in unison that there's no alternative to the market, and the market is the best possible system. <coughs> However, things are beginning to change. I'm sorry that the speakers from Egypt aren't here, aren't here tonight, because they represent something incredibly important. A revolution in Egypt a country of 80 million people, the key country in the Middle East, the heart of the Arab world, the industrial and cultural centre of the Arab world, with an enormously rich history of political struggles and political movements. A revolution in Egypt is not some minor marginal affair. It's a huge event. It's a world historical event. And what we are seeing in in front of us, on our computer screens, on our television screens, is the unfolding of a revolutionary process of the kind that took place during the Russian Revolution uh, at the time of the First World War and on many other occasions. And I say revolutionary process because I think it's now clear that the revolution wasn't just about 18 glorious days in Tahrir Square back in January and February, that it, it's, it's a much longer term and more protracted process. And we had a very important confrontation recently with the occupation of Tahrir Square, um, which is still at a certain level g going on, but that started in, 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 in late November. Because what did that reflect? That reflected increasing numbers of Egyptians coming to recognise that it wasn't enough to get rid of a dictator, of a person. They had to get rid of the regime that he presided over. And also a recognition that the generals who run Egypt and who have expressed their determination to continue running, running Egypt after the elections that have started to, to take place are central to that regime and need to be broken and need to be got rid of. And how did the generals react? The generals who had said, we will, the Egyptian army will never fire on the people. Well, you can, you know, you can go to YouTube and you can see the films where the soldiers and the riot police are firing live rounds at the demonstrators, are firing tear gas that has blinded very many people, killing, they kill dozens of people in their attempt to break the revolutionaries. But they failed. They failed in that attempt. And this is incredibly important. You have this, um, I mean, it's an, it's an important step in the development of the revolution, the way the Shabab, the the young, predominant, the, the predominantly working-class youth 
that have dominated the fights in Cairo and other cities in the past few weeks held their ground and prevented the army and the route police from, from crushing them. Now, it's a contradictory situation because what we're talking about is still a minority, although a very big minority, a minority that can bring hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets who, who understand that the revolution has got, got to go further. Not the whole of Egyptian society, which is why the elections went ahead, but what this shows is that we're in the middle of a revolutionary process in which there are advances and retreats. But the revolutionaries, through not being crushed and standing firm in their rejection of the army, have won, I think, an important victory. But it's only one battle in a much longer war. And decisive in that battle, as it was back in January and February, is going to be the development of the workers' movement in Egypt, which has taken giant leaps forward in the past few months. There are now one and a half million workers organised in ind independent unions. They've waged tremendous mass strikes, almost a general strike back in September. But that workers' movement has got to develop organisationally and politically to a stage where it becomes the leader of a revolution that doesn't just break the regime, but breaks capitalism in Egypt. And through doing that, um, inaugurates a revolutionary process that will spread not just through the Arab world, as, a, or, as it already has, but globally. And even now, the example, the image, the vision of Tahrir Square has gripped people's imagination. You couldn't have had the Occupy movement, which has so reframed the political debate in the United States, taken the argument away from the right-wing nutcases of the, the Tea Parties. You couldn't have had that happening without Tahrir Square. What Tahrir Square has done is to give us an image of collective self-emancipation for the 21st century. We don't, when someone asks us what our alternative is, how we see society changing, we don't have to talk about, uh, we can, it's still very important to talk about the Russian Revolution or May 1968 or many other revolutionary experiences of the 20th century, but we can point to Tahrir and say that's how we see society changing. And then people can decide whether they like that or not. And what's becoming clear is lots and lots of people around the world aren't simply angry at the bankers and the rotten politicians, but are beginning to identify the problem as the system and beginning to see th that the road of Tahrir, the, ro the road of collective self-emancipation from below, offers a political alternative. And that means that the idea of revolution is not simply something that's in the history books or something for theoretical discussion. The idea of revolution is regaining a historical and political reality. Well, if that's true, and I genuinely think it's true, this has been a year beyond my imagination. I couldn't have dreamt of a year like this. You know, you couldn't fantasize of a year like this. Or, well, maybe it's I'm not a very good <laughs> fantasist, but, you know, this, is, this has been an incredi incredible year. If that's true, that if revolution is back on the agenda, then we need revolutionaries. And subjectively, there are clearly lots and lots of revolutionaries around, around the world. There are lots and lots of people who identify with Tahrir, who identify with Occupy. But to be an effective revolutionary, you have to be organised. You have to be part of something bigger than yourself. You have to be part of a collective force that can begin to shape the struggles that are taking place. And that's really what we're talking about. Not simply solidarity with Egyptians, not simply support for the workers' struggles that are... Not support, direct participation in the workers' struggles that are developing in this country, but building a stronger and more rooted revolutionary organisation that can increasingly shape and lead those struggles. OK, I just want to make two points. First, about the riots, which Chaz was quite right to, to, to mention... Because if, if you remember, back in August, when the riots took place, there was the most tremendous deluge of nonsense that was said about the riots. These are the barbarians, a sign of symptoms of moral breakdown. Cameron, it's nothing to do with poverty. Even people on the left talked about, who, who should know better, talked about feral youth and that, that kind, kind of thing. And I remember writing an article which said, 
the riots are about three things. One, the police. Two, poverty. Three, the EMA. Now, I, I, didn't, I don't claim any great insight in saying that. It seemed to be absolutely obvious, both from you know, what was happening. And Chaz is absolutely right to connect to when he talks about the role that the working class college students played in the, making the student revolt a year ago so explosive. There was a continuity between the, the, the things like the 9th of December, the you know, semi-insurrectionary moment. We should, shouldn't we have a party to celebrate it? You know, when the Charles and uh, whatever her name is, I get them mulled up. I nearly said Diana got surrounded by the mob and so on. Um, there's a, there was a continuity between that almost insurrectionary element of the student movement and what happened in August. And now we have this huge study from the Guardian and the London School of Economics reading the riots, which says, having talked to lots of rioters, that guess what? The riots were about the, the cops, poverty, and the, the EMA. In other words, there's a direct... Con the riots were one expression of the kind of change in the mood, the movement to fight that everyone has been talking about this evening. And one of the things that's important about the revival of the work, workers' movement is that it gives the young people who were involved in the riots another kind of direction, because riots, riots aren't perfect. One of the people who's interviewed summed up what, the problem with the riots. He said, we should have gone to Chelsea. When people riot, they riot in their own neighbourhoods and often it's their own people who become victims of the riots. That what we need is targeted struggle and essentially the revival of the workers' movement and the strike movement is about that. That's one thing. The other thing I just wanted to talk about was the banana problem. What do you do in Basingstoke? Well, you see, I think... Basildon, sorry. <laughs> you know, I, sorry. I, I've never really understood much about English geography. Um, I'm a foreigner. Um, but um, the, you see, one of, the, one of the distinctive things about the present struggle is the way in which it affects a very, very broad section of the population. I mean, the miners' strike that Martin talked about was magnificent, but miners, the mines were concentrated in relatively limited and on the whole quite in inaccessible areas. You know, it was often a big, you know, it was a struggle to, to get to the pits, to be with the pickets and so, so on and so forth. The thing about attacking the public sector is that public sector workers are everywhere. Why was there a big demonstration in Truro? Because there's schools and local councils and uh, health workers, etc., etc., in Truro as they are everyone, everywhere else. So in Basildon, you'll find plenty of the people who have been involved in the, stri in the strike movement. That's why I think that's partly why the strike movement is so important, because what you can see is it reaching very deep into the depths of British, British society and giving people an experience of collective action and, and struggle, which, as people have been saying, are going to have very, very profound effects. So I wouldn't worry too much about Basildon. The, that's, part, that's part of the remedy, simply you know, find other public sector workers. The other, the other remedy is, of course, to join the Socialist Workers' Party, but I think you've got a form in your hands, so the solution to that is in your hands.